So last week we talked about the um, the pure mind is different from um, the good and bad mind, right? Uh, so um, William, what do you think? I think we discussed before too. What do you think? Is just um, articles was to utilize a pure mind, or we need to swing back and forth between good and bad mind, bad thoughts. What do you think? Which one is more practical? Hmm. Well, I th I think which one is more practical? There's one that's more common. Mm -hmm. Good and bad, thinking good and bad is more common. Okay. Um, I think, you know, like, in someone who's teaching Zen, they wouldn't, uh, they, they would... You know, it's like the the absolute and the mundane can fit into each other kind of perfectly so that there's no there's no real obstruction to the to that to that pure mind. There's there are like habitual habit patterns. There are where do we put our attention? What choices do we make? And so it can appear to be difficult to practice um, cultivating the pure mind to leaving space for the expression of the pure mind. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think the, the practice of, of, of being mindful of what, you know, what I do that when I have an opportunity to choose what I do that is in the way of that that obscures that or that clouds that if i choose to distract myself during a time when i could when i could focus um so i i i think practical but not necessarily easy but uh how about we discuss about um, remain unbiased or keep on my unbiased to what anyone else unbiased my that's been the pure mind right that's when bad and pop between good and bad, right? So you think it's practical, is, is this beneficial and practicals in this uh, current day? Yeah, in that sense. I it's hard to imagine living a life where you have some regard for your family to not to not acknowledge differences in relationships. Mm. So, and I don't know that that's necessarily in conflict with, with being unbiased because clearly like the relationship with my mother is going to be different than the relationship with a, another woman of her age and, and her age group. I just, there's not the same opportunity to relate in the same way. We don't have the same history. I don't won't know that other person as well, but if I was able to help that other woman yeah, I don't know that I would go as far as I would for my own mother. Mm -hmm. I don't know because if I went as far as I would for that other woman and then something happened to my mother, I might not be able to help her then because mm -hmm. I already overextended myself helping this other person. Mm -hmm. So I do, in that sense of like caring equally regardless of relation, especially like involving like limited resources, mm -hmm. Then I, okay, when you pose it that way, yeah, it it seems a it seems a little impractical because then who's gonna if I'm taking care of just anybody, who's gonna take care of my family? Mm -hmm. Well, Ivan, what do you think? Is just easy to remain unbiased, especially in your job, right? Uh, quality control. It's easy for you to remain biased when you check your product, regardless uh, who make that product. That's easy, but hard. I don't know that it's e neither easy nor hard. It takes conscious effort, um, you know, to see in myself or see in an inspector, I guess at this point, because I'm not doing the direct inspections, I'm acting upon someone else's data collection mm -hmm. to then see the bias, right? If 
they themselves are, you know, had a run in with one of the welders or if, oh, I know this line always produces this air. So that's the only thing I'm going to look through. And then I end up in a exclusion fallacy because I'm looking for a single thing. I'm excluding other information. Um, yeah, I don't know that it's neither easy nor hard. It's con conscious effort to bring back to center. So uh, most of the time when you go out to check those product, right? So would you know the one that produce or make those kind of products? You know them well or you don't know them well? I do know them well. Okay. Um, I've been with the company for five years. Okay. I have documentation telling me previous failures. Oh. I can look at blueprints and revision changes and stuff engineering mm -hmm. has done to try and improve the product etc but yet even with knowing the product well you always approach it with or at least for me i always try to approach the product with an empty mind mm -hmm. you know it, it it's it's going to tell me the story of its own life like it It has an existence, not just in our manufacturing, but how the customer is using it. Are they using it properly to design intent or are they abusing it? it? It has its story that it can tell me and I can see that through the progression of the product. I mean, how many people uh, making those products? Only one, two, three groups of those people to produce those kind of products? Or many of them? Um, we have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people that probably put hands on these products at any given time. No, I mean, at the one, the main one that you check, I'm not talking about the whole part, I'm talking about, let's say, how many group people produce those kind of products so that you can test them out. You mean in our manufacturing facility, or you mean in? Yeah. So let's like, say uh, let's say one group A make mm -hmm. uh, how many uh, products? Group B make how many products? Group C and so forth and so forth. So how many group them in the process? Six. So we have two different sides. I refer easy to them as big and small. Okay. So on bigs, we have probably 20 okay. plus variations of product. Okay. On the small side, we have 32,000 variations on product. Okay. So my point is that let's say uh, the leader of group one, the leader of group two, two three, four, five, let's say up to 20 groups, right? All right yeah. So if you remain unbiased, is this easy for you to? see whether those products uh, are up to the communication or uh, if you know them well, if you somehow, I mean that if you know the leader, right? The leader well, would you uh, still remain in bi unbiased when you check uh, the quantity of those products? Do you understand my point now? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. And is that if the more you know people, the more bias you have, or the more you know people, the more you yeah. remain unbiased. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. The hand of the maker is always in the part. It's almost like a signature, especially for welding or the fabrication to some extent. They the parts come together in a certain order for that person. They their welding it has their hand in it right it's their signature but even seeing the hand of the maker or knowing the team or that person i still have to approach it with an empty mind because they may have had their coffee today and they may be bang on you know or they may have had a fight with their wife and when they left the house and everything coming off that line is a problem i don't know so i have to approach it every day every part product every hour as individual as independent Yeah, so that's me, not empty mind, but unbiased mind, right? Mm -hmm. It's just more practical, right? 
So William, so yeah. of course, when we compare the stranger with our family member, definitely we have more bias toward our, our, our we prefer to support our family members. But let's say when you work with all patient, right? You gotta support your it's better to remain unbiased, right? Yeah. So let's mean somehow um in that case it's easy to apply the pure mind then. There's a there is there's a payoff, yeah. There's definitely a payoff. I think the 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 work is in distinguishing the preferences, yeah. Being mindful of preferences that arise so that they don't take root. Yeah. So um for for a group of stranger, it's easy to be unbiased, right? We can treat everyone equally, mm -hmm. if we can, right? But if it's delayed to our family members, uh, whoever we know, somehow we have tendency, right, uh, to um, to give them favor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even in the um, I think in in most of the the profession, whether in in my teaching career, in my medical career. In, in the um, business, uh, uh, my first career, yes, most of the time, right, they have the policies that we're not supposed to, to be biased to discriminate anyone else, right, in general. But, but specifically, when you deal with the one that we know, somehow we have that kind of tendency, right, we have tendency to uh, give favor to the one that we, lo we know, the one we will love. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's be, maybe applicable, sometimes it's not. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but um, for the Buddhist monk, right? For the one, as I said, Buddhist Sabha, we need to go beyond attachment of our family members, of our um, loved one, and so forth. Mm. Okay, yeah, let's just uh, go back to our discussion today. And that's where we um, uh, we stopped last time. Uh, yeah, so um. Uh, Ananda, he's so surprised, and he asked the Buddha um, that uh, if he doesn't use his um, disseminating mind, so how could he know, right? And let me start first then. So here, and here this one, right? Uh, William, uh, Ivan, yeah, when you were not here, we discussed about this. So he's surprised that um, his according to the uh, Ananda, the thinking mind is his own mind. The Buddha say, no, that's not your own mind. That's the false mind. That's a problem. That's why we discuss the difference between the pure mind and the good and bad mind. The pure thought and good and bad thought. The unbiased one and the biased one. Make sense, Ivan, you follow? Okay, good. From his line seat, the Buddha, in order to teach Nandam and the assembly so that they could all achieve patient endurance of the unbreeded, um, that's mean the Buddha um, uh, would held out his hand to touch another head, saying, the Tathagata has always said that all phenomena are manifestation of the mind, and that's all causes and effects including all things from the world to the stars, take shape solely because of the mind. Ananda, if we look at all the words and all assistance, uh, including even grass and leaves, and in investigate their roots, they are all make up the matter and have qualities. And even the empty void has name and appearance, and how can the pure and clean for far bright mind, which is the underlying nature of every disseminating mind, be without its or substance? If you grasp firmly the knowledge which come from your dissemination between the feeling and seeing as your true mind, it should have its own nature of independence of all sense data so that form, smell, taste, and touch. 
as you now listen to my sermon on the Dharma, you differentiate, you differentiate because you hear my voice. Right. So the point, the word I say that um, um, uh, so everything is, is manifested by the mind, right? Uh, and everything in this world, whether the doors, uh, everything has a shape and a form. Uh, it comes from the mind too. Uh, so even the cries, the leaf, and so forth, um, whether they have the form or uh, on the shape, they came from our own mind. Mm. That's the underlying of everything there. Mm. Okay. Uh. So one more thing, if uh, we attach formally to our knowledge, we come from this uh, dimension uh, between the feeling and seeing as our true mind, that's, uh, that's just wrong, you can say that. Mm. Yeah, so that's in whichever thing we discriminate. Uh, it can It doesn't come from the pure mind. It can come from the false mind in Buddhist view. Yeah. Okay. It makes sense, uh, William and Ivan. Anything else? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please, William. The seventh. Please. The seventh consciousness is unreal. Even if you succeed in putting an end to all seeing hearing, feeling, and knowing, and so preserve inner quiet, the shadow of your differentiation of things, dharma, still remains. I do not want you to hold that this is not mine, but you should examine it carefully and minutely. That which continues to possess discerning nature, even in the absence of sense data, is really your mind. On the other hand, if this discerning nature ceases with sense data, this is merely the shadow of your differentiation of them. For they are not permanent, and when they cease to exist, so does this so-called mind. Like the hair of a tortoise and the horns of the hair, if your dharmakaya can so easily cease to be, who will then practice and realize the patient endurance of the uncreate? It's understandable. It's hard. Yeah, well, I I think it's it's understandable, but there's also something, uh, I think <laughs> profound in there because in trying to explain, um, something that's you know beyond beyond explanation, um, there's, uh. It seems that like the I think it, it 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 kind of begs a direct seeing and looking in and like experiencing it to understand it but so that it's it, so that the Buddha is saying that um when the when someone st allows their mind to still is no longer um getting input from sense data that the the part that can still uh, discern even in the absence of sense data that 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 is really Ananda's mind. That's really my mind. But that the mind which is only discerning relative to some sort of sense data that that is just the kind of illusory mind um and it doesn't exist separate from that sense data when that sense data falls away it falls away and how could that be the true mind because then you know who would be able to realize how could that realize the the buddha way because it's too shallow and transient and impermanent um so the the part that i think my mind dwells on to kind of like wait for it to unfold more is the discerning nature that doesn't cease with sense data and discerning is kind of similar to dis it's kind of similar to discrimination discerning is like discerning involves some like this or that um understanding what is what 
Um, so that it still discerns. I mean, it would it be kind of similar to saying that there's still like understanding? Would that be synonymous as saying that the mind the mind still understands, but it's kind of the same as saying it discerns? Mm. Continues to possess discerning nature even in the absence of sense data is really your mind. To possess to certain, I guess that part is that part is is catching me a little bit that which continues to possess discerning nature so is he saying that the true mind possesses a discerning nature beyond interaction with sense data hmm. or is he just saying that 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 discerning nature beyond sense data there is no discerning there is no discrimination when sense data is truly gone mm -hmm. so i think in this process it's a neither one right you don't attach to your discern right uh no uh 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 recognize that right so um mm, so basically uh the pure mind is the one that mm, recognize everything but uh we're not supposed to attach to those pure mind too right Otherwise, it's become uh, what we call a hair of a tortoise and the horns of a hair. That means we cannot recognize a puma at all. Okay, so it's a little bit um, profound here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ivan, can you read this, please? Yeah, sorry, can I cannot hear you? Thank you, Ty. After hearing this, Ananda and all those present were completely bewildered, uh, refuting all inversion. The Buddha said, practicing students, even after they have realized the nine successive states of dana, yeah. uh, still can't step out of the stream of transmigration and so fail to become arhats. Because they cling to the samsaric false thinking, which they mistake for reality. This is why, though you have heard much of my dharma, you have failed to win the holy fruit. Hmm. Now, you, you can... I'm not 100% sure about the nine successive states of Donna, yeah. but he's talking about this idea of you can stand on the path, right? You can you can walk the path least walked, but if you still cling to this, I the samsara to this idea of death and rebirth, you you can't break the cycle. So long as you cling to it or rely upon it. Yeah, it's understandable, right, William? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he said that even even someone realize attend to the nine success to stay up the yana, that's the meditation. There's many, there's nine levels. Uh, but uh, if they still attach or cling to some sorry, false thinking, uh, with the mistake for reality, that means if they still attached to their um, achievement, they still get stuck there in Buddhist sense. Mm -hmm. 
because then they could say, you know, I have achieved yeah, that's a point. the nine states of jhana. Mm -hmm. So the I is just empowered. That's a point. Remember the seven consciousness focus on the I, on the cell. I think we discussed this before, right? So that's mm -hmm. that cell there. In Buddhist view, you need to transform. You need to transcend it. Otherwise, with the small notion of the I, no matter what type of uh, meditative state of mind that we are due to, we still get stuck there. So for our heart, we need to let go of the attachment to the cell, the big cell here. It's not easy. Right, especially um, for someone that may uh, attend to even up to the nice success to stay up the Yana meditation. But if they still have a thought of attachment to their achievement, they get stuck there. That's a bit different. Ivan, do you follow Ivan? I do follow Tar. Yeah. Okay, all right. The inverted perception. After hearing this, Ananda in bitter tears prostrate himself with his head, knees, and elbows on the ground. Neil and Brown brought his two palms together and said, After I left home to follow the Buddha, I merely rely on his transcendental power and always thought that I could discern. With the practice, since he would bestow a samadhi upon me, I did not know that he could not be my superstitute, and so lost sight of my fundamental mind. This is why, through I joined the order, my mind was unable to enter the town. I was like a destitute son running away from fathers. I only realized now that, in spite of much listening to the Dharma, if I do not practice, I should come to nothing, as if I have not heard it. That a man who cannot satisfy his hunger by merely speaking of food, for all the ones I am caught by the two hindrances because I do not know the real nature of the still and permanent mind. May the Tathagas speak become passionate enough fully to reveal to me that wonderful bright mind and so open my town eyes. So again, so he admit that um, uh, he uh, thought that the Buddha will give him enlightenment right? or samadhi, but there's no way. Uh, so that's why even he joined with orders when become a Buddhist monk, but he could not enter the Tao. That's mean realize the true nature of reality. Hello, Moto. Mm. Yeah. So um, uh, even he listens so much of uh, the Buddha teaching, but if he doesn't practice, uh, he would not achieve anything. Uh, like um, he can talk about the, the title or the food, right? But uh, he would not taste the food, so there's no way for him to be fulfilled. But that's why he mentioned that he caught by two hindrance, right? Mm, and that's why he gets stuck there and he could not recognize the real nature of the uh, still and the permanent mind. That's mean the pure mind. So that's why now he asked for the Buddha teaching. So in Buddhism, it's just quite different from all the traditions, right? Uh, we support to learn and practice, not to understand the principle alone. It's not enough. It's like we um, learn, we, they have to try by passing the permit, right? If we don't practice, there's no way for us to try. Right? Like um, students, they learn chemistry in the class, but without going to the lab, they would not recognize how um, the chemical draft uh, in the lab, right? That's why it's so important to do the practice here. Is that right? Okay, right, uh, Ivan and William. Mm. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, let us move on then. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. A bright light to reveal the one reality. Thereupon, the Tathagata from the Savastika on his chest 
sent out a radiant, multicolored, precious light, which illuminated the Buddha lands in the ten directions, as countless as the dust, and which, after shining on the heads of all Buddhas everywhere, veered to Ananda and the assembly. The Buddha then said to Ananda, I now hoist the banner of great Dharma, so that you and all living beings in the ten directions can realize the pure and bright mind of your profound and subtle nature, and so win the eye that is pure and clear. Yeah, so whenever the Buddha emits light, I, uh, you know, today you've taught us that there's a there's a meaning behind um the location from which the light's emitted, maybe perhaps even the color. Uh, and in this case, so it's going from the Buddhist heart to the heads of all these other Buddhas. That's interesting. I mean, generally the heart, it's, it's uh, an expression of compassion. I mean, in this case, he is, it's not because of Ananda's like intelligence that he asked the right questions. This is really something that is the the buddha rescued ananda from this mistake and is teaching him something that ananda doesn't really know how to question about so it is it is compassionate and it's touching the heads of the buddhas i mean generally they like the head of the buddha would be considered just such such purity um the, so that this is also like a very a very high teaching maybe the symbolism there I'm not sure uh, about it being multicolored. Mm. And um, yeah. Well, you touched um, the right um, uh, information there. So he admits the multicolor light from his chest, right? The uh, swastika, right? The swastika side, right? Remember, yeah. it's been. Uh, with the uh, Buddhist and ancient tradition so many thousand years. Uh, so that's why some people, they mess up, uh, especially Buddhist swastika with the Nazi one. But anyways, you touched the right one. Yeah. Uh, the Malai come, his chest is just acting represent compassion. And compassion go with the wisdom, right? They admit to uh, the head of all the Buddhas. Right, the head, head of the Buddha re represent the wisdom and, and the the life from his chest, uh, from his um, his heart is recognized as a compassion. So in this teaching, right, he combined compassion and wisdom. So Ivan probably you may not know much about why the Buddha admit the life before he taught, right? You may not know much, right? So we are with talk about that, uh, especially um, uh, doing our discussion for the um, Dhamma, I mean, that flower, Dhamma, I mean, I saw it, um, the uh, dotted flower, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you touched the important. So the life emit from the chest of the heart represents compassion. And the touch to the head of the old Buddha represents the wisdom. So compassion go ahead and has wisdom. It makes sense, uh, Ivan. It does make sense. Yeah. So... Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. please. Returning perception to mind, Nanda. A moment ago, you said you saw my shining fist. Tell me, how did its brightness come about? What caused it to take the form of a fist, and with what? Did you see it? Ananda replied, the Buddha, his golden-hued body is like a precious hill and manifest the state of purity and cleanliness so that the fist shone. It was really my eyes that saw him bend the fingers and form a fist, which was shown to all of us. That's okay. You can stop there. Yeah. So now the Buddha tests him again, right? So many times until he recognized, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's about? So, yeah, he's testing him again of how is he seeing or perceiving. Um, the fist, right? Food. He blows the fist. Yeah. 
did come, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he get here again. He said that he. I mean, talk about Ananda. He said that it was really my eye that saw. We would have test him again, right? This is the third time. So this time he still mentioned, oh, his eyes saw the Buddha fish, not the mind, right? Okay. The Buddha said, in truth, uh, wise people should be awakened by example and analogy, another. If I had no hand, I would have no fish. And if you have no eyes, you would have no faculties of sin. Is there any connection between your organs of sight and my fish? Uh, another replied, yes, we're only one. If I have no eyes, I would have no faculties of sin. So there's an analogy between my organs of sight and the Buddha fish. So somehow he said the connection there between his eye and, and Buddha fish. Right? It is common sense. But now again, he based on his own eyes. So the Buddha just tells him again, right? Uh, so that eventually he lead them, he lead him to recognize his own mind or pure mind. Yeah, please, um, William. The Buddha said, your reasoning is incorrect. For instance, a handless man has no fist, but a man without eyes still has his faculty of seeing. When you meet a blind man and ask him what he sees, he will tell you there is nothing but darkness in front of him. Therefore, though things may be screened from view, the faculty of seeing continues. Mm. And I've, I've never gotten to ask a blind person this. I've never thought to. And I also kind of wonder, like, if they were blind from birth could they even distinguish darkness because they would they'd have to know light to know darkness um so this is you know early on the buddha encourages us in one of the sutras i always forget is it the the kamala sutra to not simply take something and agree with it so i try to think about you know my my reasoning and how i understand it and it, it definitely makes sense to me to someone who has seen and then loses their sight that yes, they would see, they would see darkness because there's still an area of, you know, the brain that's, that's processing, ready to process images, but it, but it can't because there's nothing coming. There's no image to process. There's no information being sent. Um, and they have a, a memory of what things are. They have a memory of light and the absence of light would be experienced as darkness. But someone who's never seen light, how could they, how could they conceptualize darkness? Maybe just by knowing that other people see things and so they see nothing. And so they infer it from, from what they know other people see. That's why we discussed it before. Mm -hmm. If they blind by birth, right? Or from birth, they could not see the form, but at least they could feel with their touching. That's why they're so sensitive. Their ears are so sensitive. They're smelling. Okay. Remember that? Yeah. So then if they can feel something's in front of them, but they don't see it, they could, they might express it. I mean, yeah, darkness or an absence of something or, okay, a sense that it's there and that there's the ability, there's the possibility of seeing, but they just, okay, okay, that makes sense. Or uh, they more sensitive when they hear something, right? They're more sensitive than us because mm -hmm. we get used of seeing things and we take the things for granted. They may be more sensitive for their smelling too, mm -hmm. testing too, because they really pay attention on What's going on there when the eyesight uh, were defective, right? Mm -hmm. So like when windows were broken, we can use the other window in different direction. So they see in different ways from us. They don't see the form, but they see through hearing. They, they see through the smelling. They, they see through the touching. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't mean that perception of sin is quite different from ours. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's why that's why he uh, he did spill right. If um no one has uh I mean that a man doesn't have the hand doesn't mean he doesn't have the feet, but uh, the one who has who doesn't have the eyes they still could recognize his sin. Um. Mm, yeah, so the scene faculty is still continue. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so um, yeah, I want this. Ananda said, if a blind man sees nothing but darkness before him, how can this be called seeing? The Buddha said, is there any difference between the darkness seen by a blind man in front of him and that seen by a man who is not blind when he is in a dark room? Ananda replied, world honored one. There is no difference. Okay. That's enough. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like you were saying, Ty, also, like, it's, it's the additional senses, you know, that allow you to see, right? You have feel and you can feel the form in addition to, like, seeing. So the mind paints the picture, not the sense organ. And, like, yeah, I really like this section because in my world of non-destructive examination of welds, we get to play with equipment like ultrasound equipment and stuff. And like you can perceive the image if you're trained to go, oh, there's a thing there, right? But anyone else looking at the image is like, oh, it's just a blob or, you know, it's a, you know, whatever. But in seeing or sensing because of the training and understanding of the equipment and perceiving the world through that external sense organ of the non-destructive examination equipment. Okay. Oh, somehow he probably he touched something that cut him out. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Let me read this one then. Hmm. Okay. The Buddha said, Ananda, when a blind man who used to see only darkness suddenly recovers his sight. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Can you still hear us, Ivan? Hmm. Okay. Can you still hear us? Yeah, please. Yeah. Your mic, please. Your mic, your cam. Mm. All right, okay, let me uh, continue, okay. So the Buddha said, Ananda, when the blind man who used to see only darkness, suddenly recovers his sight and sees everything clearly. If you say that it is his eyes which see, and when a man who saw darkness in dark room suddenly lights a lamp, which enables him to see what is there, you should say that it is the lamb that see. If a lamb can see, it should have the properties of sin and should not be called a lamb. If it really sees, it has no relation to you. Therefore, you should know that why the lamb can debut the form since come from the eyes, but not from the lamb. Likewise, why your eyes can debut the form. The nature of sins come from the mind, but not from the eyes. So here the Buddha light out the part, right? So when we light the light, the lamp inside the dark room, it's not because the lamp, but because the eyes. So and again, uh, the nature of sin uh, come from the mind, but not from the eyes, because um, if someone blind, they still have ability to see in different ways. So, so he lie down, right? Step by step to the steel, whichever thing um, Ananda brought up before. Is that, is that my sense right, William? Yes. Hmm. Okay, Ivan, you still here? I am. I'm sorry. I forgot I put a timer on my phone. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is that this, um, 
Julian. Okay, inverted men. Although Ananda in the assembly had heard these words, they remained speechless as they did not awaken to the teaching. They brought their palms together and waited for the Buddha's further instruction with their minds set on hearing it. Yeah, you can continue. Yeah. The, the worldlings inverted views. The Buddha then held up his shining hand, straightened his fingers to give further instruction to Ananda and the assembly and asked, After I attained enlightenment, Bodhi, I went to Mrugadava Park, where I told Ajnata Kaundinya and his group of five bhikshus, as well as you monks, nuns, and devotees, that all living beings failed to realize enlightenment and became arhats because they were misled by foreign dust, which created delusion and distress by entering their minds. What at that time caused you to awaken so that you can now win the holy fruit? Mm. Hmm. Yeah, what a time. So the Buddha is discussing how initially how he taught and made certain distinctions um, about this sort of that they're basically a, this idea of there being an impurity that diluted the mind diluted their minds. And so what caused them to awaken so that they could win the holy fruit? Um, I mean, the first, if, if I just say immediately what comes to mind as I start to ponder it, um, that there was some, there was some understanding And where, you know, where did the understanding come from? I mean, I think the easy answer is like, maybe without, without working through it, through total understanding is that it's, it's in the, the, the nature of mind, um, more clearly seeing, you know, where the Buddha is working to um, kind of separate them from a greater delusion. And but like kind of it seems like he's he's asking a very core question what is it that caused them to awaken yeah i think understanding seeing cause and effect seeing how it's true and that's that's a tough one yeah i'm not sure that okay. that i can really answer that solidly okay that we we can continue to um Read the next one then. Ivan, can you read? Yeah. I don't know this name. Haganata uh, then rose from his seat and replied to the Buddha, I am not a senior in the assembly in which I am the only one who has acquired the art of interpreting because I had awakened to the meaning of the expression foreign dust so that I won the holy fruit. World honored one, foreign dust is like a gust who stops at an inn, oh, a gust, a guest who stops at an inn where he passes the night or eats something and then packs and continues his journey because he can't stay longer. As to the host of the inn, he has nowhere to go. My deduction is the one who does not stay is a guest and one who stays is a host. Consequently, a thing is foreign when it does not stay. Again, when the sun rises in a clear sky and its light and its light enters the house through an opening, the dust is seen to dance in the rays of light, whereas the empty space does not move. I deduce that <laughs> I deduce that that which is still is the void and that which moves is the dust consequently a thing is dust when it moves the okay. buddha said correct okay so you can sum up this was about um they're seeking this expression of foreign dust 
Um, he goes on to explain in his mind, foreign is something that travels on and doesn't stay or settle and dust repeats the similar idea it is something that is always moving or trying to seek a place but never finding a place um or you know and together kind of stretching for this idea that foreign dust is something that doesn't belong so thus it always continues to move almost Hmm. Okay. So you understand why he mentioned this is the monk, one of the first time monk that the Buddha taught. So, William, you know why he talked about the thorns, dust, and the sun? But we will say yes, that's correct. Yeah, it didn't seem to answer the question. He seemed to just restate his understanding of of what the buddha taught mm -hmm. um but he didn't say what actually was you know the the thing that caused him to attain the holy fruit um so why he talked about he, he seemed to be just going back over his understanding of what the buddha taught mm -hmm. and that seeing, I mean, I think he's seeing that all phenomena are are temporary, mm -hmm. uh, um, and thus we can't find a self in them. There's no self in them, um, and then that's that's liberating because much of our lives we spend trying to kind of find ourselves, prove ourselves, improve ourselves, protect ourselves by engaging with you know things in the world. Um, and that once those are seen as not informative with respect to our true nature and seen as temporary, a cause of suffering, if we attach to them, no self, then, then it's free. Then we stop, we stop, stop striving after it. And there's a relief that comes from it. Um, yeah. So somehow here, right? Or this monk. The reason why he attend our ship, uh, the uh, holy food because he recognized, he recognized the foreign dust, and uh, he gave the analogy right. The horse stay back at the inn at the hotel, the guests move on. But then, so would I say yes? That's correct. So it's implying the pure mind stay back. The always thinking. If this to mind, we move on, like a guess. Make sense now? But that's why you would I say correct there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's be confusion. Yeah. Ivan, yeah. Does that make sense? Do you have any question? I'm okay. Huh? I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, let's just move on then. Okay, uh, here, here, the Buddha say, the Himalaya is in worship view. The Buddha then bend, straighten, and they bend his fingers and ask Ananda, What do you see? Ananda replied, I saw the Buddha open and close his fist. The Buddha asked, You say that you saw my fist open and close. Where well, is my fist or your seeing that open and close? Ananda replied, as the Buddha fished open and closed, I saw that it and not the nature of my sin did so by itself. The Buddha asked, which one moves and which one was still? Ananda replied, the Buddha hand was not still as to the nature of my sin, which will already be your step to it. It could not be put up move. Now here the Buddha say, correct. It makes sense now. Now the uh, recognize. Remember, William, remember the story that the uh, Huynang Shit Patra, when he met two monks, right? Uh, when they discuss um, whether the flax is moving, right? All the monks say, no, the wind is moving. But uh, mm, uh, uh, um, the Patra say, no, not the, neither the flax nor the wind. Your mind is moving. 
Mm -hmm. So another mesh recognizes whether the Buddha open the fist or close the fist, right? That's his body, that's his mm, fish physically. But the nature of his sin is still, he recognizes that now. Right, he recognized that the pure nature there. The Buddha hand was not still, that means the Buddha hand is moving. But his nature of sins already go beyond the state of stillness. It's going to move. It's going to move. So that's why the Buddha said, yes, this is right. All right. So he got that now, right? Okay. Yeah, so um, go ahead, please, um, William. Thereupon the Buddha sent out from his palm a radiant ray of light to Ananda's right, and the disciple turned to look at it. Then he sent out another ray to Ananda's left, and the disciple turned to look at it. The Buddha then asked, Why did your head move? Ananda replied, I saw the Buddha send out radiant rays of light to my right and left. I turned to look at them, and so my head moved. The Buddha said, As you turn to the right and left to see the Buddha light, is it your head or your seeing that moves? Ananda replied, Well, honored one, it is my head that turns. As to my seeing, which is already beyond the state of stillness, how can it move? The Buddha said, correct. So now he recognized, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, William. Yeah. yeah, what happened then? Yeah, so the the Buddha makes this demonstration to to cause Ananda to move his head in order to ask this question, um, to further see if if Ananda is understanding the seeing nature, and that it's it's beyond um, it's beyond change, mm. and Ananda answers correctly. Okay, so he got that right. The fish mm -hmm. and the moving of the head, right? You recognize his sin nature is still there. It's a move. Mm -hmm. But um, his uh, head moves back and forth. Okay, so um, time is up. Let's stop here today. And we discuss um, next week then. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, Ivan, you will come this time Friday? Yes, I plan on being there this Friday. Okay, and Sunday we have the special function, you know, up, right? Yeah, I, I'm i going to try and bring my parents, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so see you, okay. So, um, oh, let's see here. Um, William, I think, let me stop here. Let me stop.